another live coaching call with Nito Marketing. Um, we host these every Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 1.30 Eastern Time. Um, and we are super excited to welcome Bonnie Shear, who is our very first Nito member who has taken the plunge to join us on our call today. Um, and I'm so excited, Bonnie. You are such a brave soul for being here. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but before we dive in, I just wanted to, you know, for those of you that are not familiar with Nito or want to know a little bit more about what we do, I've actually spent the past week, week and a half, really thinking about um, the impact that we can make. So Nito has been around for a year and a half, two years. You know, we've gathered a lot of data because we have over 640 members now. Um, we've gathered a lot of data within that membership to understand the true needs of Montessori schools and, this, and specifically Montessori administrators. So our goal, our overarching goal is to increase the presence of Montessori education across the United States and worldwide. We're starting to tap into resources worldwide, um, so, which is really exciting. We've got a couple schools in Australia that we're working with, um, but ultimately we wanna be able to support you, Montessori School Administrator, um, or those that are interested in marketing, to help you gain the tools and the knowledge that you need to be able to build your school, build your culture, and eventually grow in whatever way that means. You know, it may not mean that you have to grow your admissions. It might be that you want to create a stronger community within your school or even in your broader community, because as Montessorians, we know how important our work is. And to be able to find those families, those community members, um, even policymakers to come with us, that's a huge part of our mission. Um, so Nito plays a small role in trying to help you with that. And you know we seek to be a thought leader in this space. And one way that we do that is we invite speakers like Bonnie to come on and speak about um, specific things that you're passionate about, but also how we can help others you know, gain the knowledge that they need. So without further ado, Bonnie, welcome to our call. Thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're gonna talk about school culture and addressing the staffing needs. But before we dive into this very um, big real topic, right? Staffing challenges are real. I hear about it all the time. Um, you know, Tani and Kristen, I see you on the call. I wonder if you've also experienced the, the stress of finding somebody to fill spots um, for, your, for your, your classrooms, right? That's ultimately a, a big challenge we have in being able to provide quality programs. Um, but Bonnie, before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about you? Oh, sure. Um, I've been in Montessori since the late 90s, um, started out as an assistant um, and sort of uh, worked up from there. Uh, spent some time away from Montessori, uh, helping to run small businesses. Um, and then uh, really, really missed being with the children. And um, there was something, uh, the the meaning and the the richness of our work and how important it is in the world. I really miss that, um, being a civilian, um, <laughs> being away from it. Uh, so I went to training to become a teacher and um, did that for uh, three years and then had my son, took a year off to stay home with him. And uh, then the job of head of school opened up at, at my school and uh, my first response was no way, never in a million years. <laughs> Um, cause I just, I saw what, uh, what our former head of school, just how intense it was. Um, but then the more I thought about it, I really felt like I, it was the direction I was supposed to go. So, uh, with fear and trembling, I said yes. And I've been doing that for three years now. Awesome. I love hearing about, um, you know, Montessorian's individual journey because it's always, it's very personal, but yeah. we, we tend to all come into this space where it's just, it's our calling. You know, it's, right. it just feels right. right. Um, and I think, you know, you and I were talking yesterday of how important it is to have the people around us um, really lift us up because right. this job is very challenging. Yeah. Very challenging. You know, you've got so many things to think about and juggle and, and right. all of that. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what you have um, about staffing. How do you create those people around you to to really bring up you know what you do and in your school so let's dive in right okay 
Um, you know, and I, I've had a, a little bit of experience with this over the three years, just uh, different life situations have moved teachers in other directions. Um, so uh, even though I've only been doing it for three years, I've, I've had to hire, um, gosh, I didn't stop my count, maybe three or four and, you know, going through that process and really refining it and, um, you know, seeing what kind of is most efficient about it um, has you know, yielded sort of a, a, a thought process that I go through in doing it, as I'm sure everybody, you know, out there does. Um, but the, the most important thing, I think, to start with is um, just knowing who you are as a school, um, especially if you're in an area that has a lot of other Montessori schools. Um, we have one that is a mile away. <laughs> and then a couple others that are close. So you really have to think about what makes your school different, what makes it special, and keep that in mind when you're hiring um, and hire towards that goal. Um, you know, and, and think about the culture of your school. Um, it, here in the West, in Arizona, it's like, you know, you'll see people in cargo shorts and Hawaiian shirts at the opera. You know, it's just generally a very casual vibe in Arizona. Um, and, and different schools, even within that, have, um, you know, kind of a reputation for how, um, how formal or casual just the parent interactions, the dress code, just everything that goes into that. Um, and so you want to think about just... Um, the mix of personalities in your staff and not necessarily hiring for, you know, to make everybody the same, but to get a different point of view, um, to round out uh, the exposure that you think the children can get to different type of people and, and different experience and what can the person you're looking for bring to enrich your school. Um, and then also you need to think about just kind of your own leadership style and, how, and I think as far as that goes, it's more like making it clear uh, to the people you're hiring kind of how things go at the school behind the scenes. Um, in my situation, we're a very small school um, and we have an admin staff of me. And so I really rely on everyone. Um, I do a, as much as I can in the summer to get everything kind of set up. And I really rely on having staff members that can kind of be told something. Uh, here's the paperwork for this. Here's the schedule. This is what we're doing. And then not have to do a lot of follow up on that. So it's very important for us in particular to have someone who's very organized and can really pay attention to their scheduling and things like that. So, I mean, that would be different everywhere, but just kind of uh, keeping that in mind as far as who you are and um, how that will fit in. And then uh, on the other side of that, uh, the pedagogy is very important to kind of uh, screen when you're hiring someone to see how do they view Montessori and, and what does it look like to them and what are their things that they, they believe very strongly in following the recipe or, you know, do they have more liberty um, as far as what they might tinker with in the classroom. And, and that, of course, varies with experience. Um, but, you know, do, do they want the three hour work cycle? Um, you know, is that important to your school or do you have pullouts for group classes? Um, you know, one of the local schools, they, they offer like guitar or Mandarin or things at certain times of day, but it's during the work cycle and, you know, that works for them and that'll work for some families. And, you know, we're pretty strong about not interrupting that. Um, but just, knowing who you are and what you expect from the teachers to kind of follow through with that so that you're all kind of on the same page um, at moving forward in your school. Um, and then as far as um, the admissions process, you have to think about um, when you're admitting students, that directly impacts their classes. And if if you don't keep the balance of uh, maybe more high energy children or children that might have more needs uh, in mind, then it's harder for them to implement good Montessori in the classroom if you're not really kind of careful of the balance that you have in that room. So um, that kind of all, all of these things, all 
bleed together as we, as we talked about yesterday. It just, you can't pull on one of these threads without all of it kind of being connected. Mm -hmm. But, um, so, you know, it's just very important to know who you are when you're going to hire. Absolutely. Um, Bonnie, if you wouldn't mind going back to that slide, I wanted to sure. ask you about um, trained versus untrained. And mm -hmm. specifically when we look at hiring guides, and yeah. we look at hiring assistants because I know many schools struggle with finding assistants that are going to stay for a long time, but also yes. are going to fit the mold of what we need in the classroom. So, for example, if right. you've got you know a guide who is who has a strong presence in the room, and you have an assistant mm -hmm. who has that same type of personality, that can be challenging, right? Right, right, so, um, and. At least as far as how how I've kind of handled that with with our school, um, I send all of the lead guides um, to the AMI training center. We're blessed to have one here in town now. Um, and I send all of our lead aides to their their assistant training course. Um, you know, I know most most schools that I've worked in do the training in house. And that's fabulous. And uh, but I've just really found the that when they go through that local training center and they're hearing it from someone else and they're hearing it from, you know, a, a wonderful experienced Montessorian that's taught this course several times and knows exactly what to say. It really um, is it's very transformative for them and oftentimes makes them want to become teachers too. You know, um, just like, I mean, if you think back to when you first went into training and just, you know, your mind gets blown by how amazing and rich all of this is. And, you know, when you, when you're looking at it and it goes from being just these weird works that they have to only use a certain way. And why does, why does everybody, why is everyone so uptight about these tiny things to understanding the why, behind everything. Um, I think that's the key part in that. Um, and, and that's entirely possible to do, um, on our, on your own. Um, uh, but it, I, I found just in the schools I've seen over the years and worked in that the assistant role is, is one that is so vital in the classroom. And I feel it's really worth investing in that, um, because the stability in that position can really, uh, create a much more peaceful environment in the room. Right. And if you are able to groom them in a way that that helps them truly understand what they're doing in the classroom, the purpose, the role, mm -hmm. um, the reason that they're there and why elements in the classroom are so important. What right. a amazing pipeline, right? If your right. guide was to leave, and I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that happen when a guide leaves. Right. Um, you've got somebody in, in coming down the line, you know? So, right. yeah, I mean, your assistants, they have one of the hardest jobs, I think. Um, Absolutely. And if we can support them and also give them a way to grow, because I think, right. you know, that can be a challenge too, where assistants feel like this, it's the end game, you know? when Exactly. You, the possibility is you could move into a, a guide role. Right. Yeah, it's it's um, finding a great assistant is a gem for sure. And we've just been really blessed here. Um, we've had good luck uh, partnering. Well, not well, they don't know we partner with them, but we, <laughs> there's a local community college and we tend to try and recruit from their education department. Um, because it's, uh, you know, they're in their first two years of school and they're learning about education. They want to be teachers. Um, and, and we found success with trying to find aids there, um, cause it's people who are already passionate about education in general and they're hungry to learn. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of our, um, I can think of three different aids that we've gotten that have just turned out to be wonderful. Um, we've gotten from that. So that, that is a great source as well. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so moving on to um, the next part, I was thinking about this, this folds into identity as well. Um, but you have to think about the standards. Um, what are you not willing to compromise on? Um, and, and really, really uh, have those be defined and, and be prepared to have reasons to defend them um, <laughs> from perhaps uh, 
a, a school board that doesn't understand like why why don't we have someone yet? You've had different applications, and you know, and and our school board's great. No shade toward them, but um, you know, that's that's something that you don't want to just compromise because you're so desperate to find someone um, due to there being not very many out there at the moment. Um, you know, so think about. Uh, training certifications. You know, if you're an AMI or AMS school, um, are are you willing to kind of give up your, um, like we're an AMI school, so give up your recognized status to have not 100% of your teachers trained at the moment? Or, you know, in what situations are you willing to compromise about that or um, be more open? Maybe is a better, less negative way to say that. <laughs> um, and then experience do you require the teachers to have a certain number of years in the classroom? Are you open to a new teacher? Um, I, I'm very grateful that the schools that hired me straight out of school were, were open to, to um, a new teacher. Um, and I think in this market, we kind of have to be. Um, and then also the education level of that teacher. Um, there's been a lot of of uh, students coming through our local training center that are not quite finished with their four-year degree and you know how important is that to you as a school do they have to have their bachelor's or master's or you know so think about those things and really really um, kind of do some soul searching because whatever you come up with you're going to have to uh, stick to it <laughs> and there will be temptations not to um, and and as I've mentioned, there there really there is a teacher shortage out there. Um, so one of the ways that I've kind of tried to um, increase our chances for finding the right fit for our classroom um, is is looking very earlier uh, in the year. Um, I I talk with our staff and. I ask them generally at the uh, like right before Christmas break if they plan on returning the next year, um, what, you know, what's going on with them. And I know we, we meet frequently, so I, I have a pretty good idea at that point, but I, I pin them down and are you, are you planning on coming back? You know, um, so that if they're unsure or they're thinking about it, then I can start kind of putting feelers out and, and seeing who's, who's out there, um, and then also you want to think about re-enrollment. For us, our re-enrollment for current families starts in February. And I personally just feel uncomfortable if I know a teacher is leaving to allow that re-enrollment season to start without letting the school community know, hey, you're not really coming back to this teacher, you know. Um, it, and there is an argument that they need to trust that we'll pick a great teacher no matter who it is. But um, it, that AMI marketing survey that came out last year where they did that study of, of different parents and they released it to everyone, you know, that really did show that parents are very attached to the actual teacher um, less than, you know, our certifications or who's running the school or any of these things. It's the individual teacher they build that relationship with. So I just feel like it, it feels a little, um, uh, not unfair that maybe is too strong of a word, but I just, I know as a parent, I would want to know when I was re-enrolling. So um, I try to have things settled by February um, just as that consideration. Right. Um, and Tani, um, or, sorry, Bonnie, Tani wants to know um, mm -hmm. what study is that? And I believe it's the AMI, the AMI one, right? They surveyed parents. Yeah. The parents. Do you know yeah. I'm trying to think, didn't that come out last, was it last summer? I yeah. don't, you know what? I am afraid to search my email right now and lest I mess up the presentation <laughs> slides. You can um, do the Google research. How about that? Um, yeah. Well, is there, um, did they, they just, I just got in an email, but maybe we could, um, is it a document that we could maybe attach to the, um, you know, after the webinar? Yes. Is that something you think? Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, that. that way we could kind of search for it after. But I mean, it, it was really detailed and very helpful because it's something it was um, 
more of a, a global look across the whole country of what do parents want and and all of that. But the, my takeaway was really it's it's about your teachers. So no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, the shortage right now. Yeah. Um, I think we're all competing for them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, another thing to think about with the teacher shortage is um, consider building a strong relationship with a training center, um, even if it's not near you. Uh, before we had one here in Phoenix, um, you know, I tried to kind of reach out and kind of get to know the people in San Diego a little bit. Um, just, you know, it never hurts for them to know kind of what you're looking for. And so that as they're giving their courses, if they know somebody is from Arizona, they might be, oh, hey, St. Peter's, you might want to check them out, that type of thing. Um, and then also you can put um, ads in at the training center. Um, more and more of them are putting them online, so that's super helpful. Um, but uh, a couple of them still have an actual book where you just send them like a PDF and they stick it in a folder that they keep at the center. But um, if you are open to new teachers, that is a great way to find people. Um, I think, goodness, for electronic communications, <laughs> and we can kind of reach out and really broaden your search. Um, and then as far as the community connections, um, I, I think we all know how small a world Montessori is. Uh, so I, if if we have a teacher that's going to leave, the first thing I do is is think of teachers I know that maybe have been complaining a lot about their their place, or 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 maybe they just are moving or having a life change, and I just kind of quietly ask around, you know, is anybody looking? You know, I don't. You definitely want to be careful because I don't want to ever like scalp or a headhunt from other schools. But if it's somebody you know personally and they've been complaining and complaining and you have an opening, I, I feel that's a fair thing to do. Um, and then the, the other uh, thing that I've kind of had success with, and actually it's how I came to this school, um, my uh, former director just called the other directors and said, hey, do you have any teachers that are maybe leaving or looking for a different place? Um, and she said, actually, I do. And um, it ended up that I had student taught in, in uh, Miss Mashoud was her name, um, is her name. She's just not in this country. She's still alive. Um, <laughs> she, uh, I had student taught with her. So she already knew me and it was a great fit. Um, but that's how she found me, but just by calling another director and saying, hey, I need someone. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, don't don't discount uh, sponsoring someone, you know, with a visa um, through an oh, I skipped uh, another one. So I'll get back to that. But international candidates are um, a great way. I mean, Montessori is such a globally focused uh, way of teaching. And we really want to stress that we're all one human family. And uh, that is a great way to do it, to to have someone from another culture in your school and really broaden the horizons. Um there's a school in California uh, that had we went through that kind of helped to arrange the visas um, for one of our teachers um, who's no longer here, but um, she was from China. And so that was really great, um, a great experience for our kids to kind of, you know, learn from her directly about her own culture. Um, but also, as you were mentioning with the, uh, with the AIDS, um, think about if you have this aid, that's great and really is passionate about Montessori. If they're interested in becoming a teacher, um, I think that's one of the best ways is to grow them from within. Um, you already know them, you know their work ethic, you know how they are with the children um, and sending them to training in exchange for an agreement to work for a certain number of years. You know, there's different ways people do that. Um, we just require, you know, a set number per whatever training is elementary. They have to stay a little longer because it <laughs> costs a little more, but, um, you know, that's, that's a wonderful way to kind of keep someone in the community. Um, the only challenge with that is, um, they can, uh, have a transition between kind of that mindset of like stepping into that leadership role and then uh, having the parents kind of change the way they view them too. But um, so far that it doesn't seem to really be that big of a hiccup that as far as what we've experienced here. 
but I'd, I'd love to see uh, more of that. You know, it's somebody that you know and you trust. So um, I would love to do that. Um, let's see. And then, so the interview process, the fun part, right? Um, I, I really view this a lot like online dating like pre-Tinder online dating <laughs> like from the 90s. Um, it's it, For me, I really try and be very upfront about who we are and, and the things that really matter to us um, to kind of reduce that initial pool of applicants so that you're not um, kind of spending time on someone who you kind of can tell isn't going to be a good fit for your community. Um, I just, you know, time is money and, and we want to get somebody as quickly as possible. Um, so just really having good screener questions. Um, and then with your questions, uh, think about what your community needs most and what do you value most in a teacher? Um, you know, I, I mentioned previously that it's really important that ours um, be organized and be able to kind of work independently once given kind of a direction, um, just because I, I, don't have as much time as maybe other heads of schools might because um, I'm doing all the different parts of that job. Um, but uh, think about what you need in your community. Um, and then I like to give kind of scenarios of, of things that might happen in the classroom or um, situations with parents and then ask what they would do. Um, and, and what I it, that really is the meat of the interview for me um, because it, it lets me know uh, how they have handled something in the past. Um, it gives me insight to their thought process, um, maybe how they problem solve, um, how they handle themselves under pressure, either from the story or from just being in the interview. You know, you kind of see how they uh, observe them trying to think on their feet. Um, but I feel like their values really come out. If you craft the question the right way, you can kind of see where their priorities lie. Um, something that's a big um, it, a big tell for me, I don't know if that's the right uh, phrase, but um, if, if their response to a scenario is to kind of look to the child as the root of the problem first before looking to themselves and the environment, in these little scenarios I give them, that's kind of a red flag for me personally, um, because we want you know, we want teachers that are really working on that inner peace and that the preparation of the spirit uh, and, and looking to get the environment and looking at the child's behavior as more of a, a, an, a symptom or an indication of something, a need they have rather than a problem or um, something wrong with them or something that is their fault and they need to be fixed, you know. Um, so I really try and frame things like that to kind of see, you know, what I guess parenting style they are, for lack of a better term. But I mean, we do. We we parent these children while they're in our classroom. We use all those same techniques. Um, and then as far as, you know, have fun questions too to kind of break the ice and just to get to know them. Um, the, the teacher I hired for next fall, I never would have known she liked gangster rap if I hadn't asked certain questions. She, um, you know, so just kind of to lighten things um, and get some insight into who they are. Um, you know, and just to kind of break it up because it can be intense. Um, and Bunny, do you have, and not to put you on the spot, um, sure. but I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay, go for it. <laughs> um, do you have any examples of questions that you for sure ask in your interview process, whether it's a mm -hmm. guide or um, an assistant or whatever you're hiring for? Are there specific mm -hmm. questions that you for sure want to ask? Well, I don't, um, I have some that are, I'm not at my desk currently because I was afraid the phone would ring, <laughs> but um, I have some, I have some in a drawer and most of the time it's, I kind of draw from my past experience from children in the classroom. Like I'll remember some kind of nonsense they pulled and like see how they would have handled it um, or um you know, I, I, my mind is blanking right now, but it, I try to always have an example of a child being quote unquote naughty, you know, to see how they handle that and, and what, 
what is their perspective on a child acting out or testing boundaries? Because especially when they first start, I mean, as all, all of us who've been in the classroom know, they're going to try you out for that first period. And so you need someone that, um, for us, it's really important to find someone that is firm, but kind. Um, and, and for me, that's been really the heart of, of finding a good match for our school, uh, because I, you know, we, we are really a gentle parenting technique focused, um, but sometimes that comes uh, with people who perhaps have difficulty also holding boundaries. Um, so it's, it's important for us to find someone that's right, you know, kind of in that sweet spot of, you know, sticking to, if they say it, they follow through with it, but in a kind way. Um, and so, you know, they're all focused on that and bringing, bringing that out. And, you know, um, as far as the fun questions, <laughs> um, one I like to ask is um, if someone had to create like a mixtape or I guess you'd call it a playlist um, of songs that really gave me a view into who they are as a person, uh, what would be those songs? And, and which artists would they be? And um, so things like that perhaps aren't the typical why should I hire you? And, you know, that if, if any of us go online and look for job interview questions, as, as I think most candidates would before, um, you know, they can kind of practice those. So I try to kind of throw some curveballs in there, serious and fun to see how they act on their feet. But right. Yeah. And I, you know, in that process, I feel like the candidate then gets to know you, right? Like it's not right. such because while this job is is serious and challenging at times and we need to take it, take it seriously, there are times where you just have to have fun. Right? Oh yeah. And if you're not having fun, you're you're probably gonna end up quitting because <laughs> right. this is not the right thing for you. you know? That's so true. Yeah. So Tani had another question. She is wondering if you have any questions um, to get at how a teacher will interact with parents. Yes. Um, I use kind of the same approach as with a child who's maybe acting in an uh, non-typical manner or non-normalized manner. Um, I will use some some examples that I've seen of parents being that same way. Um, you know, if, if a parent yells at you or um, gets snippy at the door or tries to have a, a mini parent-teacher conference at the door, I think we've all gone through that. You know, how how do you handle that in a way uh, that lets them know you you care about what they have to say and you you want to be there for them, but this perhaps isn't the right space. Um, so I I run through those same um, same kind of scenarios um, just to see how the, how they would handle them. Um, and and that's the tricky thing about if you're inter interviewing someone who's not been in the classroom before, um, there are some questions you just really can't ask. You know, you can't ask about a time where you gave a child a lesson and they refused to repeat it and how did you handle it and because they don't know yet. Um, so you do have to get a little bit more creative with theoreticals at that point. Mm -hmm. um, Let's speak a little bit more about putting boundaries around parents. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she said, you mean you have naughty parents too? No. <laughs> Never. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I've kind of wrestled with putting things in the parent handbook, you know, as far as like parent conduct kind of paragraphs. And, um, you know, I've, I've poked around um, in the Ma group, you know, occasionally to see what other schools have for that. And um, I think you kind of have to know your community. And um, I don't like to put too much in there that seems negative because I don't like as a parent, if I read a handbook and they had like, four paragraphs about what kind of conduct is expected from parents, I'd be like, whoa, what has gone down at this school? <laughs> so I think it's like a, a fine line to walk between, you know, saying something like we expect everyone to conduct themselves with respect. Uh, you know, this we're, we're all about respecting the child and uh, we have to model that uh, for each other. Um, mm -hmm. But I, you know, we've definitely had scenarios where where parents are um, perhaps acting out of their own fear and pain and maybe not in a more peaceful way. Um, and in that case, it's more of kind of the approach is more kind of shut it down, move them away and then talk once they're calm. Um, because as we know, as a child, right, they can't you can't reach that reasoning part of their mind if they're 
in their feelings. Um, it's just cut off. So, uh, and foremost, obviously protecting the children from seeing anything inappropriate or hearing any special words that might be flying from a parent's mouth. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know. There, there's just always going to be some parents where you kind of secretly do a jig when they move along or their child ages out. Um, <laughs> this is the nature of the business, but I mean, by and large, it's not that way. Uh, so I think we've just been pretty lucky. Right. And I've also seen it in the past where when you have such a strong culture um, mm -hmm. of how you treat each other, right. you're going to get those naughty parents, to use Tani's words, um, <laughs> and they're either going to weed themselves out or they're going to conform. And that, I, I, for lack right. of a better word, conform is, is really to immerse themselves into what we are as a community. Exactly. Um, and Tani also mentioned she sticks to grace and courtesy and they have a conflict resolution process in their handbook. The end. Nice. Yeah. yeah. That's good. You know, and we, we have one in our staff handbook just, you know, but I, I haven't put one in there for parents, but I do think that's smart. I mean, we, we have it internally. We just don't spell it out. Like for instance, if, if two parents are like super mad at each other because their kids did, you know, this, this happens everywhere, I'm sure. Your kid hit my kid. No. Nah. And they, uh, we absolutely never bring those two into the same room and, and give them any chance to get in each other's faces. Like everything is always through us as far as what they need to know. We never name the other child, but, you know, obviously the kids tell the other person. But we really try to kind of keep keep all their communication straight with us instead of with each other. So there's sort of like, we do have internal guidelines um, that we follow, but um, we just don't spell it out to the parents. But that that is probably something I should add. So good tip, Tani. <laughs> That's why I love these conversations. <laughs> yeah. And, and Tani, to attend live, you know, it, it helps us um, add value to what we're doing, but also gives you, you know, a place where we can go back and forth and, and shoot some ideas across. I mean, by no means do we have all of the answers. Um, and I don't think we ever will. I think that's just part of the human process. Right. But because we're so invested in what we do, right. And mm -hmm. we love what we do. And I'm sure we have dreams about what we do. And we wake up at 3 a.m. And we think about, you know, yes. what we've done differently or what we're going to do tomorrow or this one child that you're just trying to get to, you know, mm -hmm. having people around you that we can just engage with and shoot ideas with. That's why I love these Thursdays. Right. That is great. I, I appreciate your input, Tani. <laughs> we've well, yeah, got one more slide and yeah. we're running out of time here. So I think we'll have about five or so minutes sure. um, before we need to conclude. Yeah. Um, so I, I'll touch real quickly just on, I, I really like having a multi-step interview process. Um, first, I will meet with them for maybe coffee or dinner. Um, I, I tend to be very instinctual with people and, and trust my gut. So um, if they make it past that step, to me, that's when the real interviews <laughs> start. Um, so I, we generally have a panel where it will be um, a coworker. Um, and then in, in the scenario of our last teacher, uh, the, her coworker, actually the, the child of that person will be in her room. So, um, so a core worker and parent, um, we usually have a board member. And then if the assistant, uh, is available. We we like to have them come too, uh, just so they kind of get eyes on and and really kind of vibe with this is the team and who you will work with. Um, and generally, it's just two people asking questions and most just kind of observing. But it, it's nice to get different perspectives on what the candidate says. Um, and then I do like to also have them do some writing, um, kind of on the spot, um, just handwritten. Uh, just to see how they kind of process uh, in, a, in a written form, because these teachers are going to be sending emails and, uh, you know, you want to make sure they have a strong handle on things and, you know, they're not going to use the wrong there um, <laughs> in their emails um, and things like that. Uh, but just for, for English majors like me, that can be quite off-putting. Um, I just like to kind of throw that in too. Um, and so compensation. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to. Tani had a question. She said, "Yeah, do you include board members in teacher hiring." Uh, yes, we have one board member uh, that spent her career in HR, 
and hired and fired pretty much for a living. Um, so she has a real uh, rich experience as far as just human knowledge and, and getting uh, energy from people and kind of reading them. So um, in, in this case, I like to have her there just to um, kind of be a sounding board for me and help me get better at the hiring process. Um, but normally that's not required. That's just something because I really value her input. Um, at our school, I'm totally in charge of hiring and firing. So it's it's not a board level thing per se. It's just a I just really like Pat and she has good input for me. I, I just, you know, because I'm new at this, I really want to try and learn from whoever I can. And I feel like there's no way to really get better at hiring unless somebody's in there watching me do it. That's done it a million times. So mm -hmm. way to use your resources. Yeah. Um, so with compensation, um, the AMI salary comes out and I laugh and laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a good basis to go off of to kind of know, um, you know, what the general trends are. Um, for us, I feel like Arizona is a little bit different because it's lumped into the West and the other West Coast places have a much higher cost of living. And and so we're kind of we don't quite fit in there. Um, so I, that's something I'm trying to troubleshoot and think of if we can just do like an Arizona salary survey, <laughs> but um, it's good to try and stick as close to that as possible. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's lots of other small schools like us out there. And, um, you know, I've trimmed as much as I can from the budget uh, so that we can really concentrate on compensation. And, and that's how you're going to get the quality candidates. Um, and, and uh, for us, one of the ways we kind of entice uh, people, which, you know, we might not be able to pay uh, uh, as much as maybe another school, but we do offer full tuition remission for their first child. And um, so there are ways to kind of enrich the pot, so to say, um, that maybe aren't just straight salary. So think about those and how you can get creative with that um, if it is a challenge uh, for you. Um, and then uh, professional development, I found um, the kind of candidate that I want is really passionate about continuing their professional development. So I want to make sure that that is part of the compensation and that I am able to send them to the AMI conference every year and um, set that aside. Um, as And I'll be honest, like our it hurts our school budget to do that, but I it's something I fight for every year because I, I want us to always grow and to have that growth mindset with, with um, our employees. So mm -hmm. um, that's, I, I know we're short on time. We're out of time. So uh, I, I will stop there with that. Awesome. Well, Tani did um, mention that she, in the, in any industry, salary surveys are inflated and they struggle with that too. Oh, okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that is comforting. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, well, Bonnie, this has been such a lovely conversation. And Tawny, thank you for joining too. And yes, it, thank um, you, Tawny. Yeah, it looks like Kristen had to leave early. Um, mm -hmm. But Bonnie, again, you are such a brave soul in taking the plunge <laughs> and, and presenting this to us because I know, you know, this is a challenge for all heads of schools regardless and right. the theme that i'm gathering from this is that you know we well one there's a, there's a challenge that we really can't influence yet right that there's this extreme teacher shortage right we we all struggle with it we all see it um and you know we are aware of the ami bold goal and we want to support that but we need to be able mm -hmm. to to staff our um, to staff our classrooms. So right. in that, you know, we're able to, there are things that we can do within our school to build that pipeline to offer, you know, those exam or those um, filler places. If you lose a teacher mm -hmm. to say their, their significant other finds a job somewhere else. And so while they love their school and their, your, your school and they're great at what they do, they have to move, mm -hmm. you know, life circumstances happen. Right. They're going to happen at any moment, right? So mm -hmm. if we have and if we think and prepare ourselves for those types of situations, we're going to be better situated to be able to staff our classrooms and really do the work that we are meant to do. Right. Right. 
Amen. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's a good point. Um, Bonnie, again, thank you for being here. And Tawny, um, thank enjoy you. the rest of your week, everyone. We will see you next Thursday. We've got Paula Preshlock from Forest Bluff. She's going to be speaking to us about um, parent relationships. And I think we're going to talk a bit about retention because I'm hearing another theme from our <laughs> of retention. Retention is hard, yes. right? Holding yes. on to those families and what can we do similar to staffing? What can we do in the forefront to be able to um, prepare ourselves for those challenges of keeping this? Right. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Please do come. That'll be fun. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thanks again, Bonnie. Thanks again, Tawny. Enjoy the rest Thanks. of your week. We'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.